have two readings today. We'll start with Matthew 13, 47 through 50, the parable of the net. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in the baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come down and separate the wicked from the righteous. And throw them into the blazing furnace, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Our second reading will be from Mark 4, 35 through 41. Jesus calms the storm. That day, when the evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that there was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This ends the reading. Well, since this is uh, my last sermon here, I, I thought I needed to go like an hour and a half, so hope you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I'm getting all kinds of great comments from the choir. Uh, we have been uh, pursuing a sermon series on crossing the waters, and the title of this uh, week is Storming the Peace, and it seems like an odd title. But it makes sense in light of what happened. As Jesus is calling the disciples and is using that, their vocation as a means for them to understand what was going to happen. So as Jesus is calling fishermen, he is, and some others too by different occupations, but fishermen in this case, he's uh, using some imagery that everybody would have understood and some of them would have really gotten because of their vocation as he's talking about using a fishing net as a symbol of God's kingdom. And the net is symbolic of life itself, that is, the catches, you, when you are living in life and you get things besides fish, you're going for certain things and it's a good thing to catch fish, but you also catch kelp, seaweed, who knows what else, and sometimes the net gets torn and there's brokenness that needs mending and healing. So there's that kind of image, and it needs cleaning. In fact, it's even said in the Bible that they were there cleaning their nets when Jesus came up. There's, there's work to be done, there's cleaning that needs to happen. And we, we get that. It's also symbolic of the reach of the kingdom that catches all people. It's cast out there for all to have the opportunity to come into the kingdom. And there's that image that's a little bit harsh, uh, where at the end of the age there's the judgment and uh, some fish are thrown out and others not. Some are kept. And that's a real recognition, even as we did in baptism, that we will resist evil because it's out there. It's real. And we don't want to be a part of it. In Jesus, we don't have to be a part of the ugliness and the evil that's in the world, the oppression that happens. We can, by God's grace, even in our shortcomings and failings, be people who lead others into the light who lead others into a relationship of love with the loving Heavenly Father. And life in the act of fishing can both be beautiful and serene or ugly and chaotic. When we come to Jesus, oftentimes we are already in a storm and we know we need some help. Many people come to Jesus that way. They've had it their way for a long time and they've messed up and they know they've really made a bad, bad situation and so they know they need some help to get out of it. Other people don't have that experience. They just have kind of always known Jesus and life has been good to them without lots of storms, even though we all have difficulties, but 
then there's a sense in which, yeah, but I, I, I want Jesus for that peace and serenity. And we expect that when we come to Jesus that we'll just have that peace and serenity all the time. And then when storms come up and the chaos ensues, we wonder, well, didn't I sign up for peace and serenity? Well, yeah, he is the one who gives peace that passes all understanding, but that doesn't mean there won't be storms and trials and tribulations along the way. And we know that from the record of the disciples themselves. Jesus himself. Fishing for men, fishing for people, casting the net wide to the whole world. Jesus is ultimately our safety net. That's throwing a different image in there. But the good news in all of this is that we have a Savior when we put our whole trust in his grace who cleanses us from unrighteousness and welcomes us as sons and daughters of the Most High. This, the thing about this, one other point that I want to make with us other than Jesus is the key for our salvation. He is the one who rescues this incident happens early on in the following Jesus, and the, the author of this study uh, had a note in there that was new to me. They said, you know, they don't fully understand who Jesus is. You know, that comes later. You know, Peter will make that confession, well, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, they know he's special. They know he's somebody who can do miracles. The crowds are following him. They've seen things. There's something about him that's different, and he's doing outright miracles. And, and those are all pretty good and impressive. They get out in the sea and the storm, and then they get afraid because they don't yet know who Jesus is. Creator of the universe stepped down into human flesh. God the Son, God with us, Emmanuel. God right there in human flesh with them. God the Son there with them. And the author, and I never thought about this, they don't think that Jesus can calm the storm because they're so astounded after it happens that they're just amazed. They're saying, who is this that could even calm the elements? At the time they wake Jesus up, the author says, they're not waking him up to calm the storm because they don't yet think he can do that. They're just waking him up so he'll take his turn at the oars and try to, <laughs> they're getting tired fighting the storm and he's back there sleeping on the cushion. And so they wake him, the author contends, that they're not waking him up to calm the storm because they don't think he can do that yet. They're just getting him up to, to, to do his job. You bail at a minimum. If you can't row, at least bail the water out of there. Come on, Jesus, help us out here. And then when he calms the storm with a couple words, they're all, then they're all going, whoa, yeah, who is this guy? And the thing about this that we shared just recently, but it's a new thought for me from just a few months ago, the sea is utterly calm. So this isn't the situation where Jesus has managed to time it just right and the, the storm has just kind of passed on and now things are getting calmer. It wasn't a timing thing, but this is, and this is why they're so stunned, because they've been out on the, the lake before. These are fishermen. They've been doing this their whole life. They get it. They know what's going on. This isn't just him being able to stop the wind or timing it just right. It says the water goes calm. It's just absolutely still. And that doesn't happen if a storm is just going through. The air can be calm, but the waves themselves are still, you know, doing their thing, and eventually they will be quiet. But no, this is, the lake is like glass, totally calm, and they're stunned. They get it. These fishermen that know the lake are now amazed. They say, who is this that can control even the elements? So the question comes to us, we all have storms, we all have things that are overwhelming. Do you know Jesus to be the one that can calm your storm or calm you in it so that you can have clarity of mind to receive 
God's wisdom, we can get so caught up in, well, we're still packing <laughs> at our house. The place is pretty much torn apart as we're emptying out closets and now we're starting to close down the kitchen, uh, trying to decide. No, I'm not asking for help. Um, well, Susan's asking for help. Oh! Yeah, that will just be more chaos. Uh, maybe. We may be calling on you. But the whole, you know, we're starting to decide, okay, in the next few days that we have, which pots and pans are we going to need? Can we pack the rest of it up? What clothes are we going to need? Can we get the rest of it in the wardrobe box? You know, just, we're, we're getting down to the place where, you know, everything's going to have to get boxed up somehow, but we're trying to, it's overwhelming, and it's chaotic. Can we trust Jesus in the process? In your situation, and ours is kind of trivial compared to life situations where people are facing you know, illnesses or caregiver for another or tragedies or just financial situations that are just ongoing and oppressive and stifling. And do you believe Jesus can help you? Or is he just a nice guy that's along with you for the ride? And that's the real question, because the disciples, again, weren't thinking that Jesus could do this. They didn't wake him up to calm the storm. They didn't think he could. But he can. Will you trust Jesus that much? Will you trust Jesus so much that you'll stop trying to earn God's favor and just flow in his spirit? Will you trust Jesus in the midst of your storms? Will you quit wanting a serene life? I mean, I, I'm there. I just want it to be easy. I want to do good stuff for God, but I want it to be all kind of smooth and under control. And that's usually not God's way. It's out on the edge, like, like Oceans is saying, out over the deep where my feet may fail. But God is there with me. Will I trust God no matter what and rely on him because he is the one that can calm the storm. He is the one that can take me through the storm. He is for a reason called the rescuer, the deliverer, the master, the savior, the healer. Is your knowledge of Jesus, is your relationship with Jesus enough to call on him right away, knowing that he can help, rather than try to struggle through yourself and then in a last-ditch effort, when everything else has failed, well, maybe Jesus can do it. A lot of us are there. Will you trust him immediately, call on him immediately, so that at a very, I shouldn't say minimum, but if it is his will that you go through this storm and taste every bit of the anxiety and the struggle, but that he's with you, right there giving you the strength and the courage to do it. Isn't it great to have Lucas here? I just, uh, we are so blessed to have the whole family. Uh, Lucas just progressing by leaps and bounds. Will you trust Jesus? Will you let him show you how great he is for your living going forward? Let's pray together. Lord, increase our knowledge of you, uh, increase our relationship with you, deepen our relationship with you, Lord. We, we know we need more of you. So as we yield to you, as we accept your lordship at in deeper levels or a, a greater yielding of ourselves to you, will you increase our capacity to receive you? Will you increase our capacity 
to trust you. Lord, increase our capacity for your Holy Spirit. Fill us and in increase our capacity for that filling that we may be amazing witnesses of your love and grace, even in, especially maybe even in the, the trials and the, the, the times that hurt, the times that are really hard. And yet, you are with us. Even as we struggle, you are with us. So we pray that even our struggles and our, our overwhelming times will be occasions where you just let us know that you're there catching us, holding us, that you are in the boat with us and that you have it all under control. May we trust you with our whole heart, Lord. Reveal yourself more and more to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, I think uh, there's uh, something going on after this. First of all, we need you to sit somewhere. There's a video. Well, hello, Pastor Bob. Surprise! Um, well, I thought to myself, since I can't be here for the service today, the next best thing would be to use video and technology to make sure that I'm able to wish you a, a farewell here this morning. I want to thank Steve Bromley for coming by earlier this week and making this happen. Um, you know how a lot of times when someone from the church has to move away and uh, have to leave this community, you always like to say, well, I'm going to call this an unauthorized move. Um, I can tell you that I consider this move on your part to be an unauthorized move, and I've told the Lord this many, many times since um, I heard about your new appointment back in early April. Um, I just wanted to come on here with a video today and just say thank you um, so much. Uh, thank you for being the great pastor. Uh, thank you for being a great leader. Um, thank you for being a great friend to me. Um, I really appreciate, uh, since I've come here, the opportunities that you've given to me um, in terms of my ministry here and ways in which you have helped me to grow um, as a leader. So thank you so much. Uh, I do appreciate it very, very much. Um, I'd, uh, I'd like to share a little funny story. You probably remember when you came to Summer Games, and it was for one of the night sessions back in 2015, and um, you and I were kind of seated by each other, and they started to play the music in the in the gym, and all the kids and that are jumping up and running around, and I kind of was standing up and looked off to my left, and I noticed you, and you were probably dancing even more than some of the kids were, so. I just kind of watched you for about 30 seconds and I thought to myself, you know what, that's our pastor and now that I know he's uh, quite the dancer, that makes you even more cool than I already thought you were. So um, that's a really fun moment and a fun memory that sticks out and there are so many more uh, that I have. Um, I would just want to again say thanks to you um, for uh, loving the Lord and displaying that while I've been here and serving with you. Thank you for your love for God's Word, and thank you for a love for people. Um, I want you to know that I'm praying for you and Susan, and we'll continue to do that as you begin your new ministry chapter um, in the days to come. Um, I, I think the best way to kind of end this would be to do the following. So I need everybody here in the congregation. Folks, are you ready? Pastor Bob, um, you join them as well. Here's what we like to say a lot. So repeat after me. God is good all the time. Excellent. Pastor Bob, blessings to you. All the best. 
God bless you. Thank you for a great run it's been. And um, someday, perhaps, I'll see you around. Take care. Bye-bye. Come up, and Lisa, you can come up too. Um, on behalf of Staff Parish and the congregation, thank you. Thank you from all of us for, um, for sharing with us your love of the Lord, your dedication, your um, love of Jesus Christ, your willingness and obedience to the Holy Spirit and for leading this congregation for the 11 years that you've been here. You've shown us your, um, your gifts of the Spirit. Um, as Michael said, and I hadn't seen that video before, um, you love the Lord with all your heart and you love people and you share all that and as well as your family. Um, just thank you so much and bless you in your future endeavors. No. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah. oh. Do it. I couldn't hear it. <laughs> Good enough. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, am I supposed to say something? Uh, <laughs> thank you all very much. Um, yeah, I didn't prepare anything uh, for this, but uh, just thank you for the, the many, many ways that you have uh, been in ministry with us. Uh, you're a great congregation, and uh, I, I love your heart for being in missions in so many different ways, locally, across the world. Uh, the way that you throw yourself into things like the Vacation Bible School, that's not a promo, that's just fact. Um, all those things. I love the way this congregation nurtures young people uh, with musical talents, a reading of scripture, uh, all those things. Um, you provide a safe place for the next generation to come and learn and to share what their gifts and abilities, not when they grow up, but each and every time through the years. So that's a blessing for kids to know that this is a safe place where they can give of themselves to. So, uh, uh, gosh, there's just so many, so many ways um, that I appreciate you as a congregation. Um, hard to leave. But God is good, and uh, here we go. Um, so I guess that says it. So much more could be said. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much for embracing us and uh, journeying with us in this. If you would stand for the closing. And may the God of all grace, who calls us to eternal glory, keep your hearts and minds established in his love and in his peace through his son, Jesus. The God who has called us to be sons and daughters of the Most High and to be friends on earth and friends in heaven, keep our hearts and minds in his gracious love now and always. Walk in his strength and in his Holy Spirit all the days of your life. Go in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>